This morning, we're continuing our series, Against the Grain. Against the Grain. We're talking through the book of Ruth, and we're looking at that in the book of Ruth, it was a time where people kind of did what was right in their own eyes. They did whatever they wanted, but there's always a group of people, always a few people that God raises up who choose to go against the grain of culture and to live a life honoring God. And whenever they do that, God uses them to do really great supernatural things. And so we're looking at the book of Ruth. Uh, This is week three. Uh, Last week, I kind of started talking a little bit about relationships. I'll do more today and next week. And then after that, we kind of veer off of relationships as we finish the book. Uh, But last week, I started off by sharing some of my favorite Christian pickup lines. And when I was done, I told several people said I missed some. So I have some more Christian pickup lines for all you single guys out there. Uh, You give these a whirl. Let me know how they work. Uh, Some of my favorites this week are this. In case you're wondering, I put the stud in Bible study, huh? That, I feel like that is, uh, some of you, uh, you're, so, yeah. Here's a good one. How many times do I have to walk around you to make you fall for me? Kind of like this Jericho walking around the walls. Okay, got a couple of Okay, guys, take note which ones the women are responding to. Here's a good one. I'm no Joseph, but can you help me interpret the dreams I'm having about you? I don't know. Is that creepy? Is that too far? All right, and my favorite one, this one might actually work. This one might work. Uh, the word, the Bible says to give drink to those who are thirsty and food to those who are hungry. How about we grab some dinner later, right? So it might work. I don't know. It might work. Today, the title of my message is this, who you are matters. Who you are matters. And one really important thing I want to stress with us today is who you are is very important. Yet so many times when we think about dating or finding the one or our spouse or our marriage, we constantly think about them. Who are they? How do they act? What do they like? And we often neglect who we are becoming and who we are as a person. So many times we focus on the other person in a relationship that we neglect ourselves. I was talking about this message uh, to Pastor Claire, and she was telling me the story. When she was a teenager, her and a bunch of girls did a Bible study, and they did a Bible study on this book, Lady in Waiting. In fact, I Googled it. I got the book, Lady in Waiting. There it is, Becoming God's Best While Waiting for Mr. Right. Well, apparently in the group, they only read the Mr. Right part uh, because all the girls in the group only talked about who Mr. Right would be like. In fact, they began to set these impossibly high standards for what their guy should look like that all the other guys in the church were annoyed they're reading this book because the standards were way too high, right? What were they doing? They were only focusing on who they wanted and not focusing on who they were. And we all do that, right? In fact, I think about how funny it is, some of the standards and and, and people, things, uh, some of the ways people want their husband or wife, future husband or wife to look like. I think about women, you know, they kind of think of the perfect man, Uh, They're like, we don't want to be unrealistic, but I'd love a man who, you know, had the face of someone like uh, Ryan Gosling, right? You know, like, oh, it'd be great if he was handsome like Ryan Gosling. And they but we don't want someone who's just all looks, right? We don't want a male bimbo. We want somebody, right, who's got some wealth, right? And so maybe they had some wealth, not a lot, nothing ridiculous, just like a Prince Harry, right? You know, maybe just a Prince Harry, Ryan Gosling, Prince Harry. But we also don't want him to be a wimp, right? We need a strong man, maybe some athletic ability. And so maybe our perfect man would also have a little Josh Allen in him, right? You know, that's not too much to ask for. Ryan Gosling, Prince Harry, Josh Allen seems realistic, you know. Guys, we're not much better, right? We often begin to dream of what our woman would look like. And we think, you know, uh, I'd love if she looked kind of like a Margot Robbie, right? Uh, just kind of beautiful like that. And, and maybe uh, they had some talent, right? Not all looks. We want some talent. Maybe they could sing like an Adele. You know, it's not too much to ask for. And every guy knows, right, every woman knows the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And so us guys, you know, we're, we're typical. We think, oh, I'd love a woman who not only loves to cook but knows her way around a kitchen like a Rachel Ray. And there's our perfect woman, right? You know, we do these things, these are completely unattainable, unrealistic. There's no one in the world ever like that. But that's our goal, to find someone like that. And we're so focused on these ridiculous things we build in our mind, and we're not even focused on ourselves. We become so focused on what we want that we refuse to look at who we're becoming. And today I got kind of a big idea, and it's this. You don't always attract what you want, but you typically attract what you are. 
You're going to attract what you're becoming and who you are. You don't always attract the things you want, but you usually attract what you are. And if you want someone who loves God, you want someone who reads their Bible, who goes to church, who is a worshiper, then guess what? You should be someone who loves God, who goes to church, who reads their Bible and is a worshiper. You want somebody who's generous and kind. You should become someone who is generous and kind. Why? Because we don't always attract just the things we want in someone, but we always attract what we're becoming and who we are. Now, if you're listening to this message, you're like, well, this is good for someone who's dating or something, but, you know, I'm already engaged or I'm married. This message is still for you because the truth of the matter is what? If you begin to have problems with your spouse, we often, what, what I, maybe I'm the only one, I think how messed up my spouse is and how they need to change, when the truth is, if we look at ourselves first, things typically get better much quicker. In fact, I just had a revelation. You know, I was getting frustrated because I realized that I was loving my wife the only way I want to be loved and not the way she wanted to be loved. I'm a physical touch kind of guy, you know. And so I give physical touch. I like to receive. So I'm pawing at her all the time. And she's not a physical touch person. She's getting annoyed at me because she's an acts of service kind of person, right? And if I just kept doing what I was doing because I was mad at her, nothing would change. But when I realized, come on, let's, I want someone to love me the way I want. She wants someone to love her the way I want. And I begin to work on myself. Things change and get better. So even if you're married, if your relationship, this message is really great for you. Uh, and so where we left off last week was Boaz noticed Ruth. If you remember last week, Boaz noticed Ruth working in the fields, and he was very kind to her. And we're going to pick up there. Ruth is reacting to his kindness. Ruth chapter 2, verse 10 says this. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. Now, before we go to the next verse, I just want to talk for a minute. What I love about Boaz's response is that it has nothing to do with her looks. It has nothing to do with how good that skirt looks on her or how she batted her eyelashes on him or did that hair flip thing that girls do. It has nothing to do with that. In fact, the things Boaz, re, that, uh, the things Boaz liked about Ruth and noticed about Ruth, and remember what kind of man Boaz was, right? He was a man of standing. He was a mighty man of valor. He wasn't like his cousins we talked about last week. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's why you got to be here every week, you know, pay, you know, hear these funny jokes. But if he, he's not like his cousins, right? Boaz was a good man. And so what did Boaz notice about Ruth? Nothing he noticed was physically about her. Everything he noticed was who she was on the inside. And he says this in verse 11. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I've heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. Boaz noticed something about her. Boaz noticed her character. And the first thing I want you to know today is they both had character. They had godly character. Number one, they had godly character. And a very important thing is Boaz had character and Ruth had character. Boaz said, yeah, I know you're a foreigner, but I also know what you've done for your mother-in-law. You willingly left your family, your people, your land, even your gods to take care of Naomi. Ruth didn't have this victim mentality. She was like, oh, my husband died. My life is terrible. Somebody take care of me. It's not my fault. I've been given terrible cards. I can't go on. I can't do anything. Ruth didn't have a victim mentality. She had a mentality of working hard. She had godly character. She had integrity. She had a good work ethic. Instead of, uh, of complaining about how bad her life was, and it was bad, she'd get up early, work hard, take initiative, and continue to show her good character. In fact, many women back then, if your husband died, you had no kids, no one to take care of you, you were forced into prostitution. It was a very terrible time of the world, and it was the only way they could afford for their family. And Ruth refused to do that. And what she decided to do was to continue to have godly character. And even if she had to beg and plead and just pick up the leftovers in a field like a poor person, that's what she did to survive. In fact, later on in the story, you would read that Boaz says, you didn't even go after younger men. Meaning, one, she was pretty enough to, go at, to attract a man, but two, she wasn't even trying to catch a man. She was trying to provide for her mother-in-law. She put her own needs aside for a time to take care of her family. Why? Because she had godly character. 
So let's go back to our big idea of the day. You don't always attract what you want, but you typically attract what you are. And so my question for you is, are you a person of godly character? Are you a person of godly character? Not your spouse. I'm not asking about them, okay? We could talk about them another day. I'm not asking about the person you like or the person who broke up with you. What I'm asking, are you a person of godly character? And let me clarify what I'm not asking you. I'm not asking if you call yourself a Christian. That's not what I'm asking. Because I know a lot of people who call themselves a Christian, but you can't tell by the way they live their lives. I'm not asking if you go to church, because I know a lot of people who go to church, but all weekend they're drinking and getting drunk at the bars. I'm not asking if you believe in God, because there's a lot of people out there who say they believe in God. They pray to God. They say, God, help me find the right person. And then they sleep with person after person after person, refusing to admit that sex is something God has reserved for marriage. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, do you have godly character? Is how you live your life publicly and privately reflective on God and Jesus? Do you have godly character? Are you growing spiritually? Are you staying pure morally? Are you not just a Christian by name, but a learning, growing disciple of Jesus? See, this is so important because if you want a healthy, godly marriage in the future, you need to start living a healthy, godly life today. It doesn't happen by the person you marry. It's happened by the person you're becoming. That's where it all starts. What does it mean to have godly character? What does it mean to be growing spiritually? Some of the things are this. You're growing and you're reading your Bible. You don't just read it, but you're understanding it, you're memorizing it, you're thinking about it. It doesn't mean you just go to church. It means you're involved in church. You're serving in church. You're building healthy relationships in church. What does it mean to have godly character? Someone who tells the truth, who has integrity, who shows up on time, who admits when they're wrong, who's able to forgive someone, someone who's being conformed to Christ daily. No, you're not perfect, but every day God is perfecting something in me, helping me to become more like Christ. Are you someone with godly character? See, if you're looking for someone to date or you're looking for someone uh, to, 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 to pursue a relationship with, you want to also pay attention to their character, right? One interesting thing, I think I've preached on this, spoken on this before, but they say we are the uh, average of our five closest friends. And so if you become interested in someone, look at their friends, Because they're going to be the average of their five closest friends. Do their friends love Jesus? Or are they a bunch of partiers who always goof around? How do they treat other people? When you go out to eat, how do they treat the waitresses? When you visit their family, how do they treat their family? Do they have a good work ethic? See, godly character is so important. If someone you're interested in is a jerk, they, only, they don't have any quality friends, they're always critical, they always have this victim mentality, it was always my boss, it was always this person, it was always that. If they're pushing you sexually, if they're distracting you from God, these are all very clear signs that they don't have godly character. And so maybe you need to put on the brakes and continue to develop godly character in your life and see what God does and brings to you. In fact, the other day I heard this quote. I love it. It says, when a person shows you who they really are, believe them. When someone's showing you their true colors, maybe you should believe them, and they might not be the right person for you. If you're realizing the person you're dating or interested in isn't pursuing God or doesn't have godly character, then it might be time to get out of Moab, to turn from Moab, and to head back to Bethlehem where God definitely has something better for you. Let's continue the story. Verse 14 says this. At mealtime, Boaz called to her, come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. So she sat with her harvesters and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all she wanted and still had some left over. The next thing I want you to know is this. They both explored uh, connection. They both kind of explored this connection, getting to know each other. There was an opportunity to know each other on a non-pressure, non-awkward way. I really like this, not just because this is how me and my wife really got to know each other, 
but he's not sliding into her DMs. Like, I don't know what that means, but that's what they say, right? He's not trying to uh, watch Netflix and chill, okay? If you don't know what that means, God bless your pure heart, but it's not really what it seems like, right? He's not trying to do these things. He's not trying to get up on her and do, get her at the club and all these things. What's he doing? He's, ha- he's having lunch with her with other people. It's not even a private lunch. There's all these people there, and there's an opportunity to explore connection, to get to know each other. It's so good to make room to find out, learn about people in non-pressure, non-awkward ways. Me and my wife, Nikki, uh, this is what we did. We first met when I went to her church to talk about the ministry I was involved in, and she was at her church leading worship. And so we were at church, each other's church, I was at her church, and it just so happened she transferred to the University of Buffalo just that month. And it just so happened that the ministry I was working for, BASIC, had a group on the University of Buffalo that met the next day. And so I invited her to that group, and I met her again at the group. What happened, we would get to know each other in these non-pressure, non-awkward, non-romantic ways just to see if we even liked each other, to see if we'd even be friends. We'd go to church services together with other people. It wouldn't just be us. And we began just to hang out, and we explored a connection. We actually got to know each other. We actually became friends before we ever dated. We enjoyed spending time with each other. Can I just be very, very honest and very blunt with you, and we could just pretend like we're all adults here? So what if you have a sexual connection with someone? So what? So what if you're attracted to each other physically? Big deal, right? But if you want a long-term, healthy marriage, you need a whole lot more than just a physical connection with someone. You really need to make sure you actually enjoy being with that person. You actually enjoy being their friend. The physical stuff is great. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's something God has gifted to us. It's a beautiful thing, but it's a tall, small, tiny little fraction of what constitutes a healthy marriage. Truthfully, the physical stuff is way easier when you have a good connection and you're friends and you enjoy each other. It's a great thing, but it's really important to explore connection, to get to know someone. For those of you who are already married, maybe you think, well, this sounds like people who are dating. Well, not really. Because how many times in marriage do we stop living like we're married and we start living like we're roommates? Right? And we stop exploring connection with our significant other. We don't go on dates. We don't do fun things. We don't learn about them. We don't even talk about their days, right? Some days, Nikki and I are so busy, I hardly even say hi to her. And all of a sudden, our connection drifts. So if you're in a relationship and you want to get back to the love and the friendship, explore connection. Do things in non-pressure, non-awkward ways just to learn about your spouse or learn about the person you're interested in. Let's continue reading. The next two verses say this. When Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her, and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. Now, the third thing I want us to see is that Boaz showed consideration. Boaz showed consideration. The law back then made a provision that allowed the poor people to pick up any grain that the harvesters dropped. So they would follow behind them, and if they dropped grain, uh, they would be able to pick it up. That was called gleaning. Now the thing is, uh, the, uh, the thing is, Boaz was following the law, but he was also going above that. He was telling his workers to drop extra grain. He was being considerate. He was helping her. He didn't give her free handouts. She still had to work. She still had to work hard and pick it up, but he was helping her. He was giving her consideration. He was being kind. He was looking out for her. And the next verse, verse 17, says this. So Ruth gathered barley there all day. And when she beat out the grain that evening, she filled an entire basket. She filled a whole basket. The Hebrew word they use there is an ephah. She had a whole ephah. What's it, ephah? Well, it's a lot of grain. They say it weighed about 30 pounds of grain. It was food for many, many days. And in one day, she gathered a ton of grain. She gathered 30 pounds of grain. Grain. Boaz was considerate to Ruth. Not only did he protect her in her fields, but he also was generous and exceeded her expectations. Here's a thought. Don't settle for someone who barely meets your expectations. Maybe you should find someone who on occasion exceeds your expectations in some ways. 
I remember while Nikki and I were still friends. We were, in the, just, we were just friends. And uh, I invited her to that basic group that Monday night. And her first time in that group, the snack they were serving was stale pretzels. And this is just something Nikki cannot stand for. And so without being asked or told, she began to cook a snack, a meal, every single basic group for her time there. She would, every night she would cook a meal. The first time my mom met her, my mom was speaking at the basic group, and Nikki's got an apron on, she's got griddles plugged in everywhere, she's cooking French toast and pancakes for people, right? She was exceeding expectations. She'd make tacos, she'd make pasta. One time me and my friends were all hanging out, and Nikki stopped by, and she brought her homemade stuffed shells. And my buddy's mom, he's, eats this, he's eating this, and he's, she's like, who made this? And I'm like, oh, Nikki did. And she's like, huh? 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 She's like, okay, well, just based upon the stuffed shells, this is a good candidate. That's what she was telling me, right? She exceeded expectations. But the truth is you do want someone who puts an effort in, right? You just want someone, they don't have to be Prince Harry, okay, or Ryan Gosling. Like, let's not be ridiculous. Uh, although I kind of have like a Rachel Ray, right? But um, you want someone who puts some effort in, who's considerate of what you need. Guys, for goodness sake, put some effort in. Don't just do what you want to do. It's, it's a, if I, Lord help me, if I hear of a guy dating someone and he makes his girlfriend watch him play video games, I don't know how I will handle it as a pastor. But please do not make your girlfriend watch you play video games. If you pick her up from a date, put some effort in. Do not honk the horn when you pull, I mean, goodness gracious. If you text her, you get out, your butt out of your car, you walk to her door, you meet her parents, right? Put some effort in. Be considerate, right? Here's the thing. You don't always have to spend a ton of money. I think one of the things that culture confuses us in is if you're considerate, you're going to buy those ridiculously priced roses at Wegmans for Valentine's Day and absurd amounts of chocolate, and you're going to blow all your money on gifts. But I don't know if that's showing consideration. Sometimes I truthfully think that's like the easy way out. And there's a lot of times you could just do stuff for free. You could go on walks. You could do all these things you could do for free. Maybe there's just a way to explore connection and to show consideration, do something they want to do. You want somebody who's going to put an effort in and likes the thing and, and, and is trying to get to know you, okay? Someone who's considerate. All right, let's keep going. The next two verses. Verse 18 and 19 says this, she carried it back to town, so all this food she got, and 30 pounds worth, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. And verse 19 says, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? And then, I love this, blessed be the man who took notice of you. Isn't that a good mother-in-law? I love what she does. I heard she, Ruth brings all this food home. And Naomi's like, who is this guy's field you're working at? Right? Something is going on here. I like this guy. I hope God blesses this guy. He seems like a good man. Right? What happened? The next thing that happened is this. Ruth received confirmation. Ruth received confirmation. You have to understand, Naomi is confirming that Boaz is a good man. He exceeded their expectations. He's a godly man with good character. And you have to understand who Naomi and Ruth are to each other. Ruth is the most important person in Naomi's life. Naomi doesn't care for anybody more than she cares for Ruth. So therefore, what Naomi thinks about a potential man in Ruth's life is very important. Because no one wants what's best for Ruth more than Naomi. And whatever Naomi says, her thought, her opinion should be weighted very heavily on how Ruth proceeds. It's always a good thing when those you know best and love you most like the people you meet. You should deeply consider what your closest, most trustworthy friends and family think about the people you meet. I'm not saying other people should ever choose who you date or marry. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying if they have one negative thing about the person you like, uh, you have to end the relationship. But what I am saying is if you are hanging around your friends, people you trust and love, people who love God, 
and you're hanging around your family, and everyone has like these concerns. Everyone's not super happy. They're a little unsettled with the people you're bringing around. Then you should have concerns. Then you should take a step back and try to say, what is everybody else seeing that I'm not seeing? It doesn't mean that if your mom likes someone, you have to marry that person. But it does mean if all your people who are close to you and trust you like the person who's around you, you might have a good candidate. They might be someone worth pursuing. If there's warnings and concerns and red flags popping up all over the place, then maybe you need to put the brakes on. Maybe you just need to take a step back and ask yourself, what is everyone else seeing that I'm not seeing? Maybe if you're dating someone or you're pursuing someone or you're interested in someone, a great opportunity is to do stuff with people you love and trust who love God. It's great to have other friends. I have a lot of friends who aren't Christians, but sometimes on really important things, it's nice to have my Christian friends weigh, on it, weigh in on that. Maybe you bring that person to church. Maybe you bring them to your small group. Maybe you bring them to an event with other Christians there. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to make it awkward, but you just hang out with your friends, and you see what the people who love you most have to say about the people you meet. I know it can be very difficult to listen to someone, criticize someone you really like. I know it can be very difficult when you find someone, you're in love with them and, and all these things, and then someone says something negative. But it's very important that we listen to the people who love us most and we trust. It's even more difficult if you're engaging in premarital sex. See, the Bible is very clear that sex is amazing, it's great, it's enjoyable, but it's reserved for marriage. Now, culture will lead you to believe that it's better outside of marriage and you don't have to wait, but that's an absolute lie that when you're married and you understand the beautiful blessing you get reserved for marriage, it's better. But Proverbs 5 tells us that sex can be intoxicating, right? And if you're engaging in premarital sex, that means you're drunk, you're intoxicated. What happens when you're drunk? What happens? Everybody looks better. Is that right? Is that not true? Right? When we used to go out and I, before I was saved, right, we'd call it beer goggles. Everyone looked better with beer goggles on. Everyone's amazing. You don't see any flaws. And so what's really difficult, if you're engaging in premarital sex and all these people are trying to tell you something's wrong with the relationship and you can't see it, it's because you're drunk right, and they look way better than they are, they are, and you need to sober up, and you need to begin to see things for the way they really are. It's very important. What are people saying to us? Now, if you've been listening to this whole message, and you think, well, that's good advice for my teenager, or good advice for this single person, but it's too late for me. I'm already married, my marriage is this old and this bad and this and that. It's too late for me with these relationships are too serious. I'm in too deep. I don't know what to do. Uh, I'm already missing it out. Well, I have good news for you. As the band comes back up, I want to continue to read the story. and want to show everybody here, no matter where you're at in your life, whether you've never dated before, whether you're married, divorced, single, widowed, whatever it is, no matter what your age is, I want to show you something really amazing in the next two verses. It says this, verse 19 and 20 says, So Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man whose field she had worked. She said, The man I worked with today is named Boaz. May the Lord bless him, Naomi told her daughter-in-law. He is showing his great kindness to us as to well as your dead husband. Because that man is one of our closest relatives. He is one of our family redeemers. He's our family redeemer. Boaz was a family redeemer. Another word to say is a kinsman redeemer. Kinsman refers to blood. He was a blood relative of someone. Being a widow back then was really a difficult life. And so the law provided that if a, a woman's husband died and they had no kids, the brother would marry the woman 
and have children to carry on her name and to take care of her to make sure she was well taken care of. But all of Naomi's sons were dead. There was no one else to marry. And so what happens is there's this kinsman redeemer. And a kinsman redeemer was a relative. And they didn't have to by law, but it was a volunteer thing. They would volunteer to redeem this person and to take care of them and their family and to have children with them so their legacy in life continues. By law, Boaz didn't have to redeem them. But if Boaz wanted to, if he showed grace to Ruth, he could redeem her and her family and he would restore all that Ruth lost in chapter one. He would write a brand new amazing chapter for her. And let me tell you about another kinsman redeemer we have. That somebody voluntarily laid their life down for us and shed their blood on the cross so we could be redeemed. That Jesus is our redeemer. And it doesn't matter how much you've lost in chapter one. It doesn't matter how long it's been since you've had a good relationship. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made or how many messed up things have happened to you. There is a kinsman redeemer we have who voluntarily shed his blood so we could be redeemed. So all that we had was lost could be restored. That whoever belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. And the new life has begun. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says it beautifully. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but it was with the precious blood of Christ. We were redeemed with the blood of Jesus. So today, I'm not sure where you're at, probably people all over the spectrum, single, dating, engaged, married, divorced, widowed, all over the place. Regardless of where you're at, we have a redeemer who redeemed us, not because they paid enough money, not because they made a promise, but because they, he voluntarily laid his life down and shed his blood on the cross so we could be redeemed. And today's an opportunity. Who you are matters. I understand you might have a much more difficult life than me. I understand there might have been things that happened to you that weren't even your fault, that were out of your control, and mistakes you've made that you really, really regret. But at some point, we have to stop living in chapter one. We have to stop living in the past. We have to get rid of our victim mentality, and we have to let the blood of Christ redeem us into a new person and pursue relationships. And I feel very specifically right now for some people who are currently married, who are currently in a relationship, and God is convicting you, and he's telling you, stop worrying about your spouse, and it's time you let me redeem you. Stop worrying about how they'll respond. Stop worrying about their mistakes. And God is saying to you right now, let me redeem you. Let me change you. Let me develop godly character in you. Let me help you explore connection with your wife to be considerate with your husband. Let me help you. And I feel like God right now, for some people, those of you who are already a Christian, those of you who would say you're a Christian, saying you're not letting me redeem you, you're holding on to something. And I feel like God is saying it is time today to allow me to bring healing to the past, to bring healing to the hurt, and accept my redemption that you can live a new life loving your spouse. And Lord, I just pray right now for whoever that is, that they would let go of the past they would let go of the hurt. In fact, I just feel like God just spoke to me that when I'm saying this, there's someone saying, yeah, but they hurt me so bad. And he's saying, man, I've got to say to you, I have forgiven you for all you've done. It's time you forgive them for all they've done. And you begin to move on and repair your relationship. Lord, I just pray right now for wherever we're at, for people would begin to accept this redemption and healing, this growth, that we could develop who we are Lord, I believe as we begin to grow and develop godly character, our spouses, our wives, our husbands are going to grow and develop godly character. And for those of us who are looking for a significant other, you're going to bring godly people to us. People who are considerate, who exceed expectations, 
Lord, you're going to bring Boaz's and Ruth's to us at the right time. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your redemption, healing power. And Lord, we thank you that anyone who calls on the name of Jesus is forgiven, is healed. If today you haven't ever accepted Jesus into your life and and you're kind of wondering, if I were to die today, would I go to heaven? If you're kind of wondering, uh, my past is so messed up, does this apply to me? Uh, The Bible says this, that if you're faithful, if if you confess it with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that you need forgiveness of your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you. So I just want to say a prayer as we get ready to sing. Lord, I just pray for each person here and for anyone who's never accepted Jesus and who's never had their sins forgiven, that even right now in their seat, you can just say a simple prayer. Say, Lord, help me. Forgive me. I confess I'm not perfect. And thank you for dying on the cross that I can be forgiven and making me into a new person. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.